Hi hey everyone, we're going to be um, continuing chapter four and the last little section covered epithelial tissue. Now we're going to talk about connective tissues, which include cartilage and bone, lots of membranes and blood, it's kind of like a catch-all category. So let's um, shimmy on through this little section. So um, the connective tissue is basically um, performing several roles. It's like providing structure in the form of bone. It's storing energy in the form of fat. It can help transport materials like blood. Literally, it has no contact with the environment unless there's some type of injury um, to the body that exposes it. So some overall characteristics of connective tissues, they have specialized cells, um, and we'll learn about those cells as we go. There's usually some type of fiber that's associated with the connective tissue, and there's then there's this um, substance called a ground substance. It's basically like the stuff that those specialized cells are sitting in. So all of that stuff makes up something called the matrix. And the matrix is what makes connective tissues different from like epithelial tissues. In epithelial tissues, we were looking at just a layer of cells. In connective tissue, we have a bunch of random cells suspended in something. That something's called a matrix. So that's what we're going to be looking at as we move through this little section. So let's look at the types of connective tissue. Uh, connective tissue is classified in three ways. It could either be called connective tissue proper, and in connective tissue proper, these are the tissues that are either connecting or protecting. And connective tissue proper can either be loose or dense, as we will see. And then there's fluid connective tissues, which are there for transport. This is like blood and the lymph. And then the supportive connective tissues, which are there for strength, such as bones and cartilage. So let's move into connective tissue proper. As I said, it can be loose or dense. Loose connective tissue proper has more ground substance and less fibers, like adipose tissue, whereas dense connective tissue has more fibers, less ground substance. This would be something like a tendon. So there are nine major cell types in connective tissue proper. We're going to look at all of these individually. Fibroblasts, fibrocytes, macrophages, adipocytes, mesenchymal cells, melanocytes, mast cells, lymphocytes, and microphages. So um, all of these connective tissue proper cells have some type of fiber associated with them, um, and they are suspended in that ground substance. And most of them are either there to maintain, repair, or defend. So let's talk about fibroblasts. Fibroblasts are the main um, cell type in connective tissue proper. It's found in all of the connective tissue proper um, tissues. They secrete proteins like hyaluron, which is kind of like a little cellular cement. There's also fibrocytes. These fibrocytes basically maintain the fibers. Um, that are within the connective tissue. The macrophages are big like Pac-Man. They squeeze and wiggle through the tissue, basically gobbling up or phagocytizing any unwanted invaders. They could be fixed, which means they're kind of stuck between the fibers, or they can be free, which means they migrate through and gobble up the proteins uh, or, or bacteria, whatever, whatever doesn't belong there. Adipocytes are fat cells. They each store a large fat droplet, and as you gain weight, that fat droplet gets bigger, and as you lose weight, those, those fat droplets get smaller. Uh, mesenchymal cells are the stem cells, which can give rise to other types of connective tissue cells, like the fibroblasts, macrophages, adipocytes, etc. Melanocytes produce melanin, so those are responsible for the pigment. They are very abundant in the connective tissue of the eye and in the dermis of the skin, that, that under layer, which we'll talk about in the next chapter. Mast cells are special cells of the immune system. They're there for um, repair. They actually are responsible for stimulating that inflammatory response by uh, releasing histamine and heparin, which are going to be vasodilators. Um, bringing about increased blood flow to the area and reducing clotting so that the blood can, can sweep through. Lymphocytes are special immune cells. Um, they can uh, produce antibodies, and we'll talk more about those once we get into the immune system next semester, but just know that they're there and they're, they're serving as our body's defense. There's also microphages, which are another phagocytic phagocytic cell, kind of like the macrophages. These guys are responding to the signals from the macrophages and mast cells. They're just another type of Pac-Man type cell. 
I don't know if you can hear my children out there. They're having a good time playing. <laughs> um, so let's talk about all of the, the tissues in general um, in terms of their fibers. We talked about the cells. Let's talk about the fibers. So collagen is the most abundant fiber of connective tissue proper. It's long. It's straight. It's unbranched. It's kind of thick. It's strong and flexible. It's usually... Um, just resisting force in one direction. So it's basically maintaining the rigidity of the tissue itself. These would be things like tendons and ligaments, which have lots of collagen. Bone has lots of collagen as well. The reticular fibers are interwoven. They're kind of like a spider web network. They're resisting force in many directions, and they help stabilize cells. Um, and they usually form a sheath around particular organs, like the liver and the spleen. Elastic fibers are made of something called elastin. It's a special protein. These are branched and wavy fibers, and you'll get to see all of these fibers in lab. You'll actually have to know those for, for one of your lab assignments. Um, they basically recoil back to their original shape, and these would be like the elastic ligaments of the vertebrae, kind of allowing us to spring back up into upright position after bending and moving. So that ground substance that these cells and fibers are in is typically a clear, colorless, odorless, viscous type um, solution. It's basically filling that space, allowing for cells to move through, and it's, it's viscous, so it actually is going to slow things down so that something like a bacteria isn't just going to be able to zip through and get to the deeper layers of our body. Here is what you should picture when you think of connective tissue proper. It's basically like a big spider webby mess of stuff. You can see all the cells in there. You can see all of the different types of fibers in there, some of those reticular spider web fibers, those big strong collagen fibers, and some of those uh, skinnier elastic fibers in there, and all the types of cells that we mentioned are in there as well. Here's an actual picture of the connective tissue proper. And you can see back and forth in this um, class, we're gonna be going between cartoon type pictures like the one you just saw, and this one here, which is an actual micrograph of cells and tissues. So you do have to be familiar and comfortable with looking at both types of images. Of course, the real image is a little bit more difficult to decipher. So we'll, we'll get practice on that in lab. Let's talk about some embryonic connective tissues. These are obviously not found in adults because they're embryonic. There's mesenchyme, which are the embryonic stem cells. This is the first connective tissue that exists in embryos, and it differentiates into other connective tissues as the embryo grows and develops. There's also something called a mucous connective tissue. Um, this is found in the umbilical cord. It's called Wharton's jelly, and it's very, basically like a loose embryonic connective tissue, again, only embryos have this. It looks very different than, again, you, you don't see very many fibers here, just a lot of mesenchymal stem cells. Those cells are going to differentiate into fibroblasts and mast cells and so on and so forth, um, which will give rise to the different tissues. So let's talk about the specific types of loose connective tissue. These, these are basically the packing materials of the body. It's basically filling all the extra spaces in between organs, in between joints. It's cushioning, stabilizing, and supporting. There's three main types, a real R connective tissue, adipose connective tissue, and reticular connective tissue. A real R connective tissue is the general, least specialized of all of these types very loosely organized. It can change shape. This is what's basically underneath our skin. We have this kind of hodgepodge network of cells and fibers underneath of our skin. It's called a real R connective tissue. It's basically an open framework. It has lots of elastic fibers to make it resilient, and usually there's some blood vessels and capillaries running through it. Adipose tissue has those adipocytes or fat cells. Obviously, it's there for padding, insulation, shock absorption. It's very common around joints, uh, as well as the orbits of the eyes around the kidneys, since there's no bony protection there. There are two different types of fat cells or fat tissue. There's white fat, which is the most common. This is what adults have. Um, it's basically storage. It's also there for shock absorption. It is there to slow heat loss and allow for insulation. Brown fat is not as common in adults. 
It's more vascularized, very common in newborns, especially on their back and neck. They have like an, an extra fatty layer. It's very, very um, energy efficient. So uh, when it's stimulated by the nervous system, that uh, fat can be broken down very, very quickly to release lots of energy. Um, and those adipocytes actually have mitochondria compared to the white fat cells, which do not. So adipocytes in adults do not divide. Um, they basically just expand to store the fat that they need, and then they shrink as those fat cells are um, released, as the fat droplets are released, as you're using that energy. And the mesenchymal cells can be used to produce more fat cells. So if you get to a point where all of your fat cells are so big um, and the fat droplet inside of them is so large, your mesenchymal cells will be told, hey, this person is not using the energy that they have and they keep on bringing more energy into their body, they need to store it. So the mesenchymal cells will make more fat cells. Let's talk about reticular tissue. Reticular tissue is there for support, just like those reticular fibers, that spider web network. That's what you should be thinking when you think of reticular tissue. It's a complex 3D network, again, very supportive, um, and this is forming what we call our reticular organs. These organs are our spleen, our liver, our lymph nodes, and our bone marrow. So in all of these special areas of our body, you will see lots of reticular tissue holding and supporting the structures within those organs. Here you see the adipose tissue under the microscope. Oops. Under the microscope, um, depending on which slide you get in lab, it may look like this or it may actually be yellow in color. The reticular tissue, you'll see these little spider web like uh, connections in there as well as little dots, which are the cells. Now dense connective tissue is very different. So in all three of the examples that we just got done talking about the loose connective tissue, it's kind of everywhere, fibers are everywhere, there's no real set organization to it. In dense connective tissue, here we're packing things together more and they can have a more regular form. Dense regular, dense irregular, and elastic are our types of dense connective tissue. So dense regular connective tissue are very basically parallel collagen fibers. So these are things like our tendons, our ligaments, and aponeurosis. And aponeurosis is a large flat sheet of tendon. Basically think of the um, covering over your abdominal cavity that is a, an aponeurosis just above um, the rectus abdominis muscle. We'll look at that later. So again, here you can see how this is very different from the reticular elastic cartilage or reticular and elastic tissue that we were just looking at. This is very regular. This is very um, structured. This is dense regular, and dense irregular is more of an interwoven collagen network. This is layered in the skin. It's also forming um, around our bones and around our cartilage to form structures called the perichondrium and the periosteum, and it can form the capsule around some organs like our kidneys, dense irregular connective tissue, lots of collagen fibers here. And here you see, it, it, when you look at the um, microscopic view, it, it looks very crazy, uh, again, because it's irregular as opposed to the regular, which was very uniform and straight. Here you're looking at stuff that's coming and going and it's crisscrossing and it's irregular in its arrangement but it's still dense, it's still densely packed together compared to the loose connective tissue that we were looking at before. Elastic tissue is made of elastic fibers. This, again, would be like the elastic ligaments of our vertebrae. And here, the big difference is it's elastic fibers instead of collagen fibers that make it up. The collagen fibers are very thick. Uh, the elastic fibers are much thinner and have a more wavy appearance to them than the uh, collagen. So let's talk about fluid connective tissues. Our fluid connective tissues specifically are the blood and lymph. They have a watery matrix and dissolved proteins amongst other cells, which we call the formed elements of these uh, fluid connective tissues. The formed elements of our blood are the red blood cells, the white blood cells, and the platelets, and we'll learn all about that next semester um, in the beginning of the semester. Here's just the uh, general picture of the types of cells. Again, red blood cells, platelets, which are not actually cells, they're parts of cells. And then all the different types of white blood cells, you don't need to be familiar with those just yet. So uh, the fluid component of these uh, fluid 
connective tissues. That's kind of a, a weird thing to say. Uh, there's plasma, there's interstitial fluid, and there's lymph. Plasma, of course, is referring to the blood. Lymph is referring to the lymph. And then the interstitial fluid is just the stuff that's surrounding all of our organs. So basically, if it's not a tissue and there's fluid around there, there's probably some cells floating in it too. That's our interstitial fluid. Lots of uh, minerals and um, ions in the interstitial fluid as well. Let's talk about lymph briefly. It is uh, basically made of our extracellular fluid. It's collected from the interstitial space. We have a whole chapter on it next semester. Uh, but in short, it's monitored by the immune system. It's transported by the lymphatic system. And eventually, it all returns into the venous circulation. So it all ends up in the blood anyway. Um, the fluid tissue is actually transported through the cardiovascular system and the lymphatic system by veins and arteries and capillaries, as well as the lymphatic vessels. So it moves, it has a, sorry about that, it, it moves, it has a, a flow or a rhythm to it with the, the heartbeat. <coughs> Excuse me. Finally, we get to supportive connective tissue. <coughs> <coughs> Woo. These are cartilage and bone. Cartilage has more of a gel type matrix, whereas the bone has a calcified matrix, a hard matrix. Both have cells in them. <coughs> Both are living tissues. Cartilage is more there for shock absorption and protection, whereas bone is there more for support and to serve as levers for, for movement with the muscles. So let's talk about cartilage first. Cartilage is made of chondrocytes. Chondrocytes are the cartilage cells. They're basically surrounded by a little nest called a lacuna. A lacuna is basically, again, I, I think of it as a nest, but it's like a chamber uh, that's amidst this ground matrix stuff. Uh, the, the cartilage matrix is made of these like uh, sugary proteins called proteoglycans, and um, the basically the proteins of the matrix produce the, these sugary compounds to help nourish those chondrocytes. Uh, there's no blood vessels within cartilage, and uh, cartilage actually produces something called an anti-angiogenesis factor, so it actually is deterring the creation of blood vessels, um, which is kind of an interesting thing, because normally your body would want blood vessels to be um, created, but not in the cartilage. Cartilage is avascular. A perichondrium is the structure that surrounds the cartilage. It's just an outer it's a fibrous layer, basically there for protection and isolation. There's an outer fibrous layer and an inner cellular layer that's there for growth and maintenance. You'll see the similar structure on the bone. This is just showing you the little chondrocyte within the lacuna and how they can grow. It's called interstitial growth. Um, and they also grow through something called appositional growth. And we'll talk more about these forms of growth when we get into the bone chapter. This is just a little introduction to it. So let's talk about the types of cartilage. There's three types of cartilage in the body. There's hyaline cartilage. This is the stiff, um, excuse me, stiff flexible uh, cartilage, which kind of sounds like an oxymoron, but it's stiff, but it still bends, if that makes sense. Uh, it's basically there to reduce friction between bones. So this is kind of that, um, that covering at the end of our bones. If you Imagine a long bone at the, at the very end of those bones is some cartilage there to reduce the friction and grinding between the surfaces. That would be hyaline cartilage. Uh, it's specifically called articular cartilage in the form of joints, but it can also be found uh, in our trachea, the little rings of our trachea, our hyaline cartilage. Elastic cartilage is like the outside of our ear. It's very bendable. It's supportive, but it bends much easier than the hyaline cartilage does. Finally, fibrocartilage. This is like the pads of our knee joint. This is there to very, very much limit movement and um, intervertebral discs and the pubic symphysis um, joint have fibrous cartilage as part of their structure. So it's much harder and it's really just there to, to separate the bones specifically. Here you see the hyaline cartilage, these chondrocytes living in their little nests called lacuna. In elastic cartilage, now we have these elastic fibers spread throughout the matrix to help give it some flexibility. And then in the fibrous cartilage, again, very um, lots of fibers, collagen fibers in there for strength and support, and then the chondrocytes living in the lacuna, much more spread out. 
We focus on bone now. Bone is sometimes also referred to as osseous tissue. It's very strong because it's calcified, um, meaning that the calcium is deposited from the blood into the bones and special cells do things with that. And we'll talk about those later. Uh, they're basically there um, as well to resist shattering. There's, our bones are made of not just the calcium and bone cells, but there's lots of collagen in them as well. And that collagen provides them with some flexibility. If you've ever been injured before where you break a bone or you bruise a bone, you've probably come very close um, or you, you may even have noticed that your bones bend in in some ways. Uh, before they break, they actually do have some give to them, and that give is because of the collagen. So bone cells are also called osteocytes, and they're arranged in a very like tree trunk type manner um, around a central canal, and there's a matrix there as well. Remember, all connective tissue has a matrix. There's small little channels that connect the osteocytes together. They're called canaliculi. And then there's a periosteum, very much like the perichondrium that was around the cartilage. The periosteum does the same thing. Outer fibrous layer, inner cellular layer, and it's covering the bone surface. Here you see the osteocytes are, are bone um, functional units called an osteon. Here you can see that periosteum covering around the bone and that central canal where our blood vessels are, and then all the little canaliculi going out to each of these individual pockets are bone cells or osteocytes. So this is just a chart comparing cartilage and bone together. Um, some of the big differences, whoops, some of the big differences uh, have to do with the fact that, again, cartilage is avascular and bone is vascular. So biggest difference there, one gets a blood supply and one doesn't. So then you have all the associated effects because of that, different metab metabolic rates, different cellular division rates, uh, different ground substance because of the various requirements from the blood. Let's finish up this little section by talking about membranes. Membranes are physical barriers um, that can line and cover portions of the body. So they basically are composed of the two things that we've talked about already, epithelium and a connective tissue. So there's two parts to them. And there's four types of membranes in the body. We have mucous membranes, serous membranes, cutaneous membranes, and synovial membranes. So let's take a look at mucous membranes first. These mucous membranes, or mucosa, are the types of membranes that line our external cavities. They line our digestive tract, they line our respiratory, urinary, and reproductive tracts. Anything that opens to the outside is layered in a mucous membrane. The epithelial surfaces have to remain moist, so uh, that's there to reduce friction, also to facilitate any absorption or excretion that may need to occur. And the lamina propria, or the connective tissue, is a real tissue for these mucous membranes. Serous membranes line cavities that do not open to the outside. These are very thin membranes. They have a... Um, double layer to them and the parietal portion is covering the cavity and the visceral portion is covering the organ. So actually in between the visceral and parietal layers is a layer of serous fluid. We're going to learn all about these serous membranes as we go, but it's important that you get a grip on what these things are and, and kind of where they are. So let's talk about the three main serous membranes of our body. You have the pleura, which lines our pleural cavities and covers the lungs, the peritoneum, which lines the peritoneal or abdominal cavity and covers the abdominal organs, and then you have the pericardium, which lines the pericardial cavity and covers the heart. So again, the outer part, the parietal part, lines the cavity, the visceral part covers the organ, and in between is a serous fluid, which is there to reduce friction. So um, here you can see some of the differences. A serous membrane, much thinner. A mucous membrane is thicker, has a thick epithelium on it, and then some type of mucus-producing cell to keep it moist. 
The cutaneous membrane, that's just a fancy word for skin. That's our outer skin. It's thick and waterproof. And then we have synovial membranes, which are lining our joint cavities. Uh, they produce a synovial fluid, kind of like the serous membranes produce serous fluid, uh, basically there to protect the ends of bones. There's no actual epithelial lining to these synovial membranes, but they're a membrane nonetheless. So here you see uh, the cutaneous, this is our skin, we're gonna talk about this in the next chapter, our epithelium, and then the uh, dermis, which is just below the epithelia, and then the synovial uh, membrane, which is just lining the joint cavity, um, could be continuous or discontinuous. So overall, connective tissues are providing some type of framework for the for all of the body's parts to be in, providing strength and stability, maintaining the position of our organs, like holding them together or holding them in place. They're also allowing for uh, blood vessels to access major organs or structures. Um, and fascia forms a, a big part of this as well. Uh, all of our organs are suspended in some type of fascia or connective tissue. So the single singular form of fascia or fascia is fascia, and I use the terms pretty much interchangeably. Um, it's basically our, our body's framework. So if you were to cut your abdominal cavity open or cut someone else's abdominal cavity open, um, you wouldn't see just a pile of organs in there. You would see lots and lots of tissue. You'd have to cut through several layers of fascia to get to the muscle. And then to get through the muscle, then you have to cut through more fascia just to get to the organs themselves. Um, so it's basically layers upon layers of wrapping around organs and structures. So there's three types. You have superficial fascia, which is fun to say, superficial fascia. Um, this is the areolar and adipose tissue that's underneath our skin and on top of or superficial to underlying organs and underlying tissues. I'll be right there. Go get daddy. <laughs> um, there's also <laughs> mother of the year. Um, there's also deep fascia, uh, which is made of dense irregular connective tissue, D-I-C-T, dense irregular connective tissue. This is composing the capsule around organs like our kidneys. And then you have sub fascia. This is that deep fascia um, that lines our body cavities. So these are the types of fascia that basically hold everything together or compartmentalize structures for our body. And here you can see just the image showing you the superficial fascia right there, and then deep fascia is just below that, and then finally the sub fascia, which is going to then lead to our serous membranes surrounding the body cavities. So I hope this makes sense. If not, go back, rewatch it, slow it down, because I know I talk fast, uh, or ask me some questions and we can chat about it. All right, I hope this helped you. See ya.